welcome everyone to our webinar on how to set your business up for success in 2023, a lawyer's perspective. Today, we'll be looking at how to build on the foundation that your business already has so that you can set yourself up for success in 2023. My name is Nastasia Nordia, and I'm a lawyer in Legal Vision's commercial contracts team. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Tim, who is a lawyer also in the commercial contracts team. Before we begin, a couple of quick housekeeping items. Firstly, you will be emailed the webinar recording and a copy of the slides. Then if we could ask that you please submit any questions that you have in the chat box, and we'd really appreciate it, please, if you could complete the survey after the webinar. Also, all attendees are eligible to receive a free legal consultation with us to discuss how we can help you with your contracts or any of your legal needs. To request your free consultation, provide us with your contact details in the survey that appears at the end of the webinar. So let's... Today we will be dis discussing business structure, intellectual property, data and privacy, client contracts, third party contracts, and employees and contractors and workplace relations. At the end of the webinar, we will also be answering some of your questions, so please submit your questions throughout the webinar through the chat function, and we will answer them at the end. And now I'll pass over to Tim to speak to us about business structure. Thanks, Nastasia. So yeah, the first point we'll be discussing today is business structure. So your business structure is really the, the foundation of your business's success. And it's, it's really important to have the right structure in place as early as possible, um, as restructuring can be quite a complex process. So as you move into the new year, there are a few questions that we'd probably recommend you ask yourself. So the first one is, um, has your business grown in size and revenue, or are you expecting significant growth um, in 2023? So if you are increasing in size, that means that you'll likely be entering into more contracts, um, which comes with greater liabilities and risks as well. So it's also important to ask yourself in this context, whether structuring as a sole trader or a partnership maybe exposes you to a bit more personal risk. In addition, if you have an increase in revenue, you should consider wh whether the personal tax rate is higher than the company tax rate. Um, with some recent changes, the companies with a turnover of less than $50 million now pay a 25% flat rate in tax, which might be better than uh, the personal tax rate. The next question um, you should be asking yourself is, has your business generated or will it generate any valuable intellectual property um, in 2023? If that is the case, we'd probably recommend a dual structure um, to be a bit more appropriate. This means that you can hold your assets, including your intellectual property within your holding company, and you can enter into your contracts through your operating company. And this is where most of the risk lies. So you can protect those assets held by the holding company. As your business also grows, you may choose to diversify and have separate companies for your business's different operations. This will limit the overall liability for each company and protect the, the assets of each company as well. The next question, if you are already set up as a company, is whether you've brought on more shareholders. Um, if so, is your shareholder prepared? Have you drafted it? And is it a reflection of um, the agreement between all of the shareholders? If you have updated it, have you notified ASIC of those changes as well? The next question is to ask whether your business licenses are correct and up to date. So these will vary by state, local laws and industry, but take now a timely reminder to check and ensure that these are updated. Um, often licenses will require an annual submission of fees or additional documents as well. What I will say as well, keep in mind that if you are deciding to restructure, this can have tax consequences. So we do have a, a tax team at Legal Vision, um, and usually we'd work alongside your accountant to determine what the, the most tax efficient structure is for you um, and your business. Um, so now I'll pass it over to Nastasia, who'll be discussing intellectual property. Wonderful, thanks so much, Tim. So as Tim said, we're going to be having a bit of a look at intellectual property and whether or not your intellectual property is adequately protected. So the first thing to consider is to look at the current IP that you hold. So your branding, 
including your business name and logo, are obviously all assets of your business, which are worthwhile protecting. It's important to note that the trademark registration process can be a long process from the day on which you lodge your application. So generally we advise that it's best to start this process early. And we also advise that you should do checks to ensure that your brands and product lines are clear for use to avoid infringing any third party rights. And obviously while IP registration um, such as trademarks is important, it's also important to remember the contractual side of, of things and protecting your intellectual property by using the contracts that you have. That's when we start to look at future intellectual property and, and contracts. So as you expand your brand, perhaps you'll add additional trademarks, slogans and business names. It's important to trademark these as well. Um, and if you're expanding overseas, consider whether you require trademark protection overseas as well. And what we say is when you enter into a contract with someone else, depending on the nature of the goods or services that you're going to be providing, new intellectual property may be created when the parties perform their obligations. So this is when you'll want to make sure that your contract is very robust and that it adequately addresses your intellectual property needs. So your contract should contain clauses which detail which party owns the intellectual property that is used or created under the contract. So in this regard, a contract should consider ownership rights in respect of the intellectual property owned prior to the contract being executed, intellectual property that's created or developed under the contract, and any improvements made to a party's pre-existing intellectual property or to the intellectual property created or developed under the contract. Another thing to consider is whether or not you will need a license to use the other party's IP and whether it would be a good idea to give the other party a license to use your intellectual property. For example, if you need to use their IP to provide your services, this should be included in the contract. And if you're going to be providing deliverables to the other party, which will include your intellectual property, the other party will then also need a license so that they can actually use those deliverables. For example, PowerPoint presentations um, and other deliverables that you may, may be giving to them. So when we speak about a license, one thing that's very important to remember is the scope of that license. For example, whether it's revocable, transferable, sub-licensable, royalty-free, um, and when the license can be used. For example, if it can only be used during the term of the agreement, or if it can be used for longer, and then the purpose of the license. So what can the intellectual property actually be used for? Then once you have all your contracts in place and you registered your IP, it's important to always just remember to ensure that you constantly have ongoing monitoring. So we suggest that you regularly check whether or not other businesses are encroaching on your registered trademarks. And if so, that you take the necessary action. For example, such as sending a deceased a cease and desist letter um, to enforce your rights to exclusively use that mark. Tim, I'm now going to hand over to you to talk about data and privacy. Thanks. Um, so yeah, data and privacy, uh, I suppose, really came to the forefront in 2022. Um, and as we move into 2023, I think it's really essential that all businesses ensure that they're up to date with their obligations. The first question you wanna be asking um, in regards to privacy is whether you're required to comply with the Privacy Act. So not every business is required to comply with the Privacy Act. Um, and there are certain thresholds that I'll just run through now. So whether your business is turning over more than $3 million per year, whether you provide a health service or whether you hold health information. So this might include gyms and personal trainers, for example, whether you trade in personal information. So that is whether you receive a benefit for trading or selling personal information, um, or if you are a contracted service provider under a Commonwealth contract. If you are any of these things, then you will be considered an APP entity, which means that you need to comply with the Privacy Act. If that is the case, the next question you wanna be asking yourself is, 
um, do you have a current privacy policy in place? Even if you're not an APP entity, we would always suggest that it's best practice to have one. Um, it just means that you have the right foundations in place for when, you, when they do apply to your business, but it also adds a sense of legitimacy for you and it provides your customers with greater confidence in your business. Your privacy policy should cover the kinds of personal information and sensitive information that you're collecting, how and for what purpose you're using, collecting, holding um, and disclosing that personal information, whether you're disclosing that personal information overseas and how you're dealing with complaints and other things. The, the policy should be up to date um, with your current practices and, and we'd recommend reviewing it every year just to ensure that it's up to date and an accurate reflection of what you're actually doing. We, we suggest looking at your privacy policy as a, as a living document. So something that should always be updated and amended um, as your business changes as well. The next question you wanna be asking is, um, whether you need a privacy collection notice. So this could be in your client agreement or given at the time of collecting personal information, um, and it should be specific to the context and the personal information that's being collected. The next topic that we're gonna be discussing is notifiable data breaches. If you are an APP entity and you suffer a notifiable data breach, then you will need to notify the affected individuals as well as the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner or the OAIC. Whether you'll need to notify will depend on whether the data breach is likely to result in serious harm to the individual whose personal information is involved, um, and if the risk of serious harm cannot be prevented by um, remedy or remediation. The Australian Cybersecurity Centre and OAIC have published some tips um, for preventing data breaches. So these are things like training employees to recognise phishing scams and spam emails, having strong passwords, um, and using appropriate security systems as well. We'd also recommend having a data breach response plan in place. Um, so this is essentially just an internal policy um, that outlines the processes that you or your employees should be taking in the event of a data breach um, and who is responsible for any escalations as well. Our final note on um, privacy and data is whether you're up to date with your 2023 data and privacy obligations. So obviously there have been some, some pretty high profile data breaches um, with some large Australian corporations such as Optus and Medibank um, in 2022. And as a result, the federal government did make a few changes to um, Australia's privacy laws just to strengthen them as well. Um, one of the most significant changes was the increased penalties. So for serious and repeated interference with the privacy of an individual, the penalties for body corporates increased from $2.22 million to the higher of $50 million or three times the value of the benefit obtained um, through the misuse of the information or 30% of the company's adjusted turnover in the relevant period. So it's not a, not a small amount. Um, the next one is OAIC now have greater enforcement powers as well. So they can assess um, entities compliance with notifiable data breach scheme um, they have greater information gathering powers, they can issue infringement notices, um, and they can compel entities to improve their practices, um, and they have greater information sharing powers. So they can publish public reports, share information with enforcement bodies, complaint bodies, as well as privacy regulators um, within certain states, but also overseas as well. Um, and the final change was the um, Australian privacy laws now have a greater global application as well. So the update has essentially removed the need for any personal information to have been collected or held in Australia. So this has the potential to capture related entities of Australian companies. Um, and it also means really that any entity that carries on business in Australia that would be considered an APP entity needs to comply with the Australian privacy laws. This is really a, a hot topic at the moment and, and we really are expecting some further changes in the coming years. So we'd suggest it's something to be aware of and, and something to, to keep in mind as you move into 2023 as well. Um, I'll pass it back to Nastasia now to discuss client contracts. Yeah. So as Tim mentioned, it's obviously very important to keep up to date with the changes and the developments. And this holds true as well when looking at your contracts and what changes have been made in that regard. So obviously when owning a business, it's very important to be aware of the terms and conditions in your agreements with your clients and whether those terms are in fact in line with current laws and regulations. 
So there are several pieces of legislation which protect um, consumers and clients, including the Competition and Consumer Act, the Australian Consumer Law and Regulations. An important part of the Australian Consumer Law, or the ACL, that protects consumers is what we call the unfair contracts term regime. And there have been some significant changes to the unfair contract term regime with the coming into force of the Treasury Laws Amendment Act. So what this regime does is it provides protection in respect of consumer contracts or small business contracts where a term in the contract is unfair and the contract is a standard form contract. So an example of an unfair contract term is one which, for example, causes significant imbalance between the rights and obligations of the parties, including perhaps giving powers to one party um, that that party would ordinarily not have, protecting one party in a way that puts the other at a disadvantage, or altering the position under the ordinary rules of contract or the general law. Another example of an unfair contract term is um, one that's not reasonably necessary to protect the legitimate interests of the business, uh, causes detriment to one party if the other party seeks to rely on it. So the court will consider a number of factors, including the transparency of the term. So for example, is the contract legible? And is it expressed in reasonably plain in reasonably plain language. So for example, if it's full of legal jargon, you may have a bit of an uphill battle uh, saying that it was in fact in plain language. Um, and the court will also look at the contract as a whole. So with the coming into force of the Act, there have been a number of changes, which you can see on the screen, um, including that a contract may now be considered a standard form contract, despite there being an opportunity for a party to negotiate minor changes or insubstantial changes to a contract. So if you allow the other party to, to, to negotiate with you, but really they can't make any significant or substantial changes, the question then arises, was the negotiation actually meaningful? Another change that's come into place is that a small business contract now applies in respect of a business which has fewer than 100 employees or has a turnover for the last income year of less than $10 million. There are a number of other changes, including significant penalties, which you can see on this slide. It's therefore critically important that your contracts do not contain any unfair contract terms. Um, so as we as we've discussed, examples of these um, is a term that allows a party to unilaterally vary some or all of the fees payable by the other party without notifying them, um, or perhaps where one party has significant rights to terminate the contract, but the other party doesn't. Um, another example that we see quite frequently is terms that lock a customer into another period of the same length after the minimum period has expired. For example, the initial term was 12 months, and after that, the contract automatically renews for another 12 month period. So all of these are examples um, of, of terms that may be considered to be unfair. So in terms of best practice, what we recommend is that you have all of your current contracts reviewed for unfair contract terms to remove any of these unfair contract terms. And then if possible, when giving your contract or your agreement to another party, allow the other party to meaningfully negotiate your contract um, to make um, change more than just a, a comma here and there or a full stop to actually meaningfully negotiate with you. Tim, I'll now hand over to you to talk about third party contracts. Thank you. Um, so yes, obviously your consumer contracts are super important, but it's also important to have the right contracts in place with um, your suppliers um, and with other third parties as well. So I'll run through a few key examples now. The first one is your distribution agreements. So if you do sell online, in theory, you, you probably can sell all around the world. However, if breaking into overseas markets is a bit of a challenge, you may choose to set up distribution channels where you have overseas distributors who know their market and have good customer relationships already in place. 
if you've worked out that you can do that and you have the products to export and supply to those markets, um, then you want to ensure that you have a really solid distribution agreement in place that outlines the rights and the responsibilities of you and your distributor. The next one is your general supply agreements. So you should have a service agreement in place with um, any individual or business who is supplying goods or services to your business. This also includes uh, manufacturing agreements. Um, if you do have a manufacturing agreement in place, you want to ensure it describes the manufacturer's obligation, um, including shipping and delivery, confidentiality requirements, and an obligation to fix defective products as well. In addition to that, um, if you're engaging a, a developer to build an app or a website for you, um, then you want to ensure that you have a development agreement in place, which includes things like an acceptance testing regime, um, some milestones for delivery, and make it clear that IP ownership um, will be owned by you at the end of the, um, the services that are being provided, um, as obviously that's a really key factor to development agreements as well. The next one are um, your software agreements. So undoubtedly you'll be using a variety of software when you're running your business. Um, it's a bit inescapable nowadays. So um, this might be things like your client management systems, uh, marketing providers, team collaboration and communication platforms, uh, payroll software or third party payment processes as well. Um, or you might even have a software offering yourself. So each of these providers will have a, a software as a service or a SaaS agreement. Um, or terms and conditions that um, you'll need to accept or potentially negotiate as well. What we'd suggest is just ensuring that you have a lawyer review these so that you're aware um, of any potential, potentially unfavorable terms. Um, for instance, if you're handing over client data to these providers, um, will they be keeping these confidential and do they need to comply with relevant privacy laws as well? Depending on who the supplier is, um, if they're a big company and they're using their own contract, or if you're going to be using your own contract, you may need to have these contracts drafted or reviewed, um, and, and we can assist with all of this as well. Um, so I'll pass it back to Nastasia now to discuss um, employees and contractors. Tim, so on the 6th of December last year, 2022, the Fair Work Legislation Amendment Act came into force. And there have been some significant changes that have been made in respect to certain areas. The first one in respect to fixed term contracts. Certain fixed or maximum term contracts may now only be used in certain circumstances. Fixed contracts really sets a time limit on an employment relationship and it has an agreed end date. So examples of contracts which can't be used except in certain circumstances are where the contract term exceeds two years. The contract allows for a new a renewal, which would result in the term of the contract exceeding two years, or there are ex consecutive contracts for the employee to perform the same or substantially similar work. As I mentioned, there are exceptions when this kind of contract can actually be used, for example, such as when an employee is hired for seasonal work or when the employee works in the government's role. And these changes take effect on the 6th of December 2023, so later this year. Another change that's come in is that more groups of employees may request changes in their working arrangements if they require flexibility due to a number of reasons. So the Act has really expanded the group of eligible employees in this regard to include employees who are pregnant and employees or members of that employee's immediate family or household who are experiencing family and domestic violence. These changes come into effect mid this year um, in June 2023. And then we also now have a new, a new group where uh, new protected attributes at work have been included. So including breastfeeding, gender identity and intersex status. So employers cannot take any adverse action against current or future employees because of these attributes. And these changes are already in force. The Act also prohibits pay secrecy clauses. So employees are now entitled to share or refuse to share information about their pay and their employment terms and conditions, which if these T's and C's were known or the pay was known, it would enable others to work out their pay or remuneration. 
and their employees are also now entitled to ask other employees about their pay and employment terms and conditions. It's also important to note that the Act will prohibit sexual harassment in connection with work. So what this means, this includes in the workplace, um, anyone who's really performing services or where it could be said that the services being provided are in connection with someone's work. And this protection applies from 6th of March, 2023. Tim, over to you. Great, thanks, Mr. Asia. So that does conclude the main part of our webinar today. Um, you might also find Legal Vision's um, SME health checklist useful. Um, it will help you identify areas in your business that may need further protection or assistance to ensure that you are legally compliant. Um, you can download it in the handout section of the webinar panel. Um, and we're also, we can also assist you by conducting a free legal health check. Um, so just leave your details in the survey at the end um, and, and we can schedule a time for that as well. Uh, we also have an upcoming event that you might be interested in. Um, it's mitigating your business's work, health and safety WHS risks. Um, and that'll be held next Tuesday at 11 a.m. Um, that's obviously Sydney time as well. Um, and you can register at legalvision.com.au slash events. So I, I think we'll have some time for a Q&A um, shortly. So while um, you're submitting them, we'll just take a minute to discuss our membership. So Legal Vision's membership is a, a cost-effective alternative to the expensive hourly rates other law firms often charge. For an affordable monthly fee, you can receive cost certainty and all-inclusive legal services, which includes um, unlimited document reviewing, including drafting, amending, and reviewing business contracts, as well as commercial leases. Um, it includes unlimited advice consultations with our team of um, over 100 specialist, specialist lawyers, um, and includes business structuring, employment, disputes, um, and more. Um, and finally, we also have unlimited domestic trademark registration within that as well. So our membership is like having your own in-house counsel, really. We'll take care of all the business as usual legal work, so you can just focus on running your business. If you are an in-house counsel, our membership may also be a cost-effective solution for outsourcing additional legal work as well. To learn more about how membership might be able to, suit, uh, might be able to help your business, you can request a free consultation when the survey appears at the end of the webinar as well. Um, and now we'll answer some of your questions. Um, I believe, Nastasia, you might have um, one to get us started as well. Sure, oh, thanks, Tim. So one of the questions that we've been asked is what contracts are required to do a business partnership? So I think that really depends on what is meant by a partnership and what you're looking to do and what the relationship of the um, or what the relationship, the business relationship is going to be between you and the other party. So obviously, if um, there's equity involved, you would be looking more at a shareholders agreement. Um, if, if not, then perhaps you're looking at more of a joint venture or a collaboration agreement. So for example, if both parties are providing services or goods to each other, uh, then we would perhaps suggest that a, co a collaboration agreement is appropriate. And in all these kinds of agreements, obviously, as I said, depending on the nature of the relationship, you would again want to address things like intellectual property, ensuring that your intellectual property is protected. You may want to consider looking at limiting your liability, um, perhaps putting a liability cap um, on, on your liability, and also then looking at the scope of the services. So what is each party obliged to provide to the other? And we always say it's very important that that is clearly set out um, in any agreement, I think, whether it's a shareholders agreement, a collaboration agreement, no matter the kind of agreement, it's really important that the rights and obligations of each party are very clear so that there can be no misunderstanding further down, down the road. Um, and in all of these kinds of agreements, obviously, one would want to look at the allocation of risk. I think that's always something that's very important to consider. Tim, I'll pass it over to you if you have any other questions. Yeah, I um, do have another question that's come through. Um, so the question was in regards to unfair contracts. Um, so the, the question says, if you're a small business um, of less than 100 employees and less than $10 million in turnover, um, and the term of, term of the contract is 
once payment is received and the service has been provided to the client, the funds are immediately taken and there's no revision of the contract, does this constitute an unfair term? I think um, it, it really depends on, on the specifics of the contract, but I think in regards to not offering a refund, that there's no requirement to provide a, a change of mind refund under the Australian consumer law. What I will say is, um, you will still need to comply with your consumer law obligations. So there are things regarding reasonable, acceptable quality um, that it lasts for a reasonable period of time and other things like that. So you can't restrict someone from requesting a refund if there um, are any issues with the good or service you're providing. Um, but I, I don't think this, that specific term of the contract would be considered unfair. Um, did you have another question, Nastasia, or anything to add to that? Nothing to add, Tim, but I did have another question that someone's asked, and that is, what is a consumer contract? So under the Australian consumer law, a consumer contract is a contract for the supply of goods or services or the sale or grant of an interest in land to an individual who acquires it wholly or predominantly for personal, domestic or household use or consumption. An example of this would be an individual who goes to Coles or Woolies and purchases their groceries for the month. That would be um, considered a consumer contract. Uh, the client or the, the, the individual is obviously purchasing some goods from Woolies um, and it is generally, one assumes, intended for personal, domestic or household use. Tim, over to you if you have another question. Yep, um, there have been a couple that have come through. Um, another one that's come through is, is a cybersecurity incident response plan uh, different to a data breach response plan? Um, I, I'm not 100% sure. I think often th these same policies have different names, so it probably is um, pretty similar. Um, as long as it's really outlining your internal policy in terms of what you're doing in response to any kind of breach or incident, I think it will generally cover the same thing. Um, the only differentiation that I could um, possibly suspect would be that a data breach response plan is specifically for um, personal information and, and your uh, privacy obligations, whereas a cybersecurity incident response plan might be a bit more of a general um, response plan to any breaches to your systems or softwares. Um, I'll, I'll pass it back over to you, Nastasia, for another one. Fantastic. So. We have another question. I'm not too sure which it applies to, whether the question applied to the unfair contract terms regime or um, to what Tim was telling us about the APPs and privacy. But the question was, in respect of the changes made, are these changes retrospective? Um, as I said, I'm not too sure which that applied to, but in respect of the unfair contract terms regime, the new regime will apply to contracts that the parties enter into at or after the commencement date um, of that act. Existing contracts that are renewed at or after the commencement date. So if you have a pre-existing contract and you and the client renew it, then that, that unfair contract term will then apply, which is why we recommend that if you have any of those kinds of contracts, it's relatively important that those contracts are reviewed for unfair contract terms before renewing, just to ensure that you then don't fall foul of the legislation. And the new regime will also apply to terms that are varied at or after the commencement date. So for example, what we often see is um, there's a term in the agreement that uh, the business owner or the business can vary the term of the term or terms of the agreement by providing notice to the other party. So if you do that and you vary a term and that term is then considered to be an unfair contract term, if you vary it today, um, then obviously it would fall subject to this, this new regime. As I said, apologies, I'm not too sure who that, or in respect of what that question actually was, but I think Tim as well, you may have some thoughts in respect of privacy. Yeah, I, I suppose just on that, in terms of whether these privacy law changes are retrospective, um, in, in terms of the, the penalties and the, um, the OAIC powers, um, they're not retrospective. So they just apply to any breach that will occur moving forward. 
Um, however, you know, if you're say a foreign entity and you are caught as now, you know, trading health, inf trading, sorry, personal information in Australia and you're forced to um, comply with the privacy laws, you will need to comply now. It won't apply to any res retrospective actions that you've made, but you just want to ensure that you're compliant moving forward. Um, so yeah, I think, I'm not sure whether that was for privacy or contract law, but you've got them both <laughs> answered anyway. Um, another question we did have that just came through was, um, do I have to register a business in each state um, if you're planning to expand the business um, and how does that work? Um, I will flag, um, Nastasia and I are um, commercial contract lawyers, so we're not experts in this area. However, I don't believe that you need to register a business in each state. What you may need to do though, if you're say within a regulated industry or if you require any kind of license, such as a liquor license um, or, or any other kind of license, you may need to have a license in every state that you're expanding into um, or to ensure that you're compliant with any of those regulations that apply to each state. So it really depends on what industry you're in and what business you're running as well. Um, I'll pass it back to you, Nastasia, for another one. Thanks, Tim. Another question that we've received is that once the term is finished from a software development agreement, can you switch software developers as deemed unfair if it's automatically renewed? So one thing I'd just like to, to point out is that in respect of the unfair contract terms regime, it really depends on the contract as a whole. So just because generally speaking, something may be considered to be unfair, if the contract as a whole balances the rights of a party or the parties out, then that term in those circumstances may not in fact be unfair. So I think it's just important to remember that there's no hard and fast or blanket rule as to what would be considered an unfair contract term. Um, and why I say that is that the question seems to suppose that um, a contract term will be unfair if it's automatically renewed. So what we tend to say is that the unfairness more comes in where you lock someone in for a long period of time. So for example, let's say the initial term was two years, and then let's say the contract said that the party couldn't cancel within those two years, um, which may also be considered unfair, but let's say that was the case, and then it automatically renews for another two years you can see that then the consumer or the client is locked in for theoretically a period of four years. Um, so what we tend to say is automatic renewal is, may not be a problem. And what we suggest is that the automatic renewal then happens on a month to month basis. So you have your initial term of 12 months and thereafter it automatically renews on a month to month basis. Um, but as I said, it's, I think, really important to remember that the contract as a whole will be looked at when considering whether or not an unfair, uh, a term of a contract is unfair. Um, but to answer the first part of that question, can you switch software developers, provided, of course, that you've complied with your obligations under the agreement and any termination rights that you may or may not have, etc. Then obviously you could you could bring a new developer on board, provided as I said, as long as you haven't reached that agreement that you have with your current your current developer. Tim, over to you. Alrighty, thank you. Um, so one more that we've come through is: Do we need a data breach response plan if all personal information is held by your service provider? Um, it says we don't access the personal information held by the service provider. Um, I, I think there are a few questions to ask in this context. Um, whether you as a business are collecting that personal information, um, whose personal information that is. So if it's the information of your customers and you have a, an agreement with those customers, then you'll be responsible really for any breach that results um, from your collection and, and holding of that personal information. So regardless of whether it's being held by a third party Often it will be held by a third party, um, such as like Google or Amazon Web Services. Regardless if there's a breach with their service, um, you'll still be responsible for um, notifying those individuals who are involved and potentially also the OAIC as well. Um, uh, did you have, sorry, anything to add to that, Nastasia? No, 
I don't. Um, but we do have another question. And the question was, can I do business without having the physical store and through online? And what are important things to take care of for this type of business and registration? So as I think we all know, a lot of businesses these days are going online, whether it's a hybrid, whether they have a physical store and an online store, or a lot of businesses are just online. Um, so if you think, for example, of software as a service or a SaaS, purely an online platform. Um, so the answer to the question is yes, you can have a business that's online. And some of the important things to think about for this um, for this kind of business, again, is um, the terms and conditions that really relate to people's use of their online platform. Again, looking at intellectual property, the license that you give people to use that platform. Um, basically, you want to make sure that anyone who does use it behaves properly. They don't introduce malware or anything like that. Um, and then obviously, you would want to look at, again, um, you know, limiting your liability and depending on what kind of platform it is, one would also then need to consider whether you need things like a disclaimer to be put in place. So, for example, if it's a platform that has has videos, online videos, um, you know, that perhaps look at things like um, um, dietary requirements or something like that, you may just want to make it very clear that any that these videos don't constitute health or medical advice. So things to think of like that. In terms of registration of the business, um, again, as Tim has flagged, we, uh, we are not corporate lawyers, but again, the, the business would need to be registered in the normal, in the normal course, whatever structure you're looking at, um, obviously, um, I'm of the view that you probably need to get an ABN, um, but as I said, the business would be registered in the normal course, and what that business does would then obviously need some T's and C's around that to ensure that the business is actually protected. I will just add to that um, as well. Um, because you are, you do have to register a physical address for your business. It doesn't have to be the place where you're working, um, but it cannot be say a, a PO box, for example. Um, there are services that can be your, your business address and they, there are services that offer that um, ability. Uh, but one thing to be aware of is that um, if someone does do an ASIC search, they can look that address up online. So it's something to be aware of if you are looking to register, say, your home address as your business address. Um, sorry to cut you off, Anastasia. Did you have anything else to add to that? Um, just, yeah, Tim's raised a really good point, and that is as well just to ensure that that business address is kept up to date. Because obviously that's the address that's going to be used for service of any process. So hopefully it never happens, but, um, you know, if um, ASIC or anyone needs to send you any documentation, if, if the, the company is sued, for example, that address will be the address that is used. So it's very important just to ensure that that business, or that business address rather, is kept up to date. Definitely. Over to you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I think actually that's all we have time for today. Um, so after the webinar ends, a survey will pop up um, and we'd, we'd really appreciate if you could complete the 30 second survey for us. Um, please include your contact details also to receive a complimentary legal consultation um, and we can discuss how we can help you with setting your business up for success in 2023. Um, I will say that there were quite a few questions regarding quite specific scenarios um, that require probably a bit more context in order for us to provide the most appropriate guidance and answers for you. So we would recommend booking in that complimentary legal consultation so we can discuss those questions a bit further as well. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for joining all of us today. We hope to see you soon. Thank you.